Hey there, I'm Bill and welcome to Project Build. For today, we're adding LED cabinet lighting hooked up to a wall dimmer switch. So before we get started, I thought it would be helpful to show a simple example of how this all goes together. So we have our 120 volt power source here, which goes into this dimmer switch. And then this dimmer switch outputs to this LED driver here. So it's actually pretty simple. The driver here takes this output from the switch and converts it to a 12 volt source that the LED lights can use. And by adjusting the dimmer switch, we can make the LEDs brighter and dimmer. And the first thing to do is to identify a power source to tap into for the LED driver. And I tap the power going to this three-way switch here to feed my new dimmer switch. And I can do this as this is the first three-way switch going to the overhead lights. If it were the secondary three-way switch, it likely wouldn't have constant power coming to it. And I have to either find a nearby existing circuit to tap or run a new circuit from the breaker panel. I've linked some resources that I think will be helpful to understanding electrical and how to identify a constant power source. And I put those down in the video description. So let's actually get to work and install this under cabinet lighting. I removed the existing wall plate from the switch I'm tapping into. And before going any further, I switched off the breaker that the switch is connected to. I disconnected the switch from the electrical box and checked with a non-contact voltage tester just to be sure there were no live wires in the box. I took pictures of how the existing switch was wired and then unhooked all the wires and set the switch aside. I used a flathead screwdriver to identify which side of the box the wall stud was located on and found it to the right of the box here. I then lined up the right edge of the new two gang electrical box that I'm going to be using with the existing box so the new box overlapped the existing one as well as a one gang opening to the left side of the existing box where the open wall cavity is. I leveled this new box, marked the outline, and then connected the lines with the straight edge. I used an oscillating multi-tool to cut out along my marked lines and now that piece of drywall lives in the wall forever. I needed to remove the old electrical box without destroying the drywall opening. This proved to be difficult, but I managed to get it out by prying the old box away from the wall stud and then separating the wires that come in the bottom of the box from those that go out the top. I used a screwdriver to pry open the plastic cable clamp so I could push the lower wires out the bottom, and the nails that held the box in were going to prevent it from fitting through the opening, so I removed those by pushing the nail into the side of the stud to start it free from the box, and then prying and pulling the nail away using nail puller pliers. With the lower wires and the nails removed, I was able to maneuver the box to pull it out of the drywall opening, and then remove the upper wires. And I'm going to put the LED driver up in my stacked upper cabinet here, but where you might put yours really depends on the layout of your kitchen. I used my laser level to identify where the wall stud would be up high and then drilled a half inch hole into the open wall cavity side of that mark. I fed a fishing tape through this hole down into the wall until it reached the lower opening. I used a utility knife to strip the sheathing off the end of a Romex cable and hooked the wires onto the loop on the fishing tape. Thinking ahead, I'm going to need to run an in-wall LED cable to bring power back down from the LED driver to the underside of the cabinet here, so I piggyback this wire to the Romex using electrical tape. I pulled the wires up through the lower opening until they came through the hole at the top using the fishing tape, and then down back at the bottom, I cut my LED cable a few feet longer than I thought I was going to end up needing. I wanted to run the LED cable through this lip on the back of the cabinet, so I center punched, drilled a 3 8 inch hole through it, and then reached up into the wall to feed the wire through from the back. With the wires run, it was time to put in the new electrical box, so I used the utility knife to cut away about 8 inches of the new Romex cable sheathing, and then fed the wires through the appropriate cable clamps in the electrical box. This was a bit difficult to do, with a bit of persistence I finally got the wires through and the box seated into the opening. I tightened the screws on the box which pulls the two tabs on the back of the electrical box up against the back of the drywall and locks the box in place. I sorted the various wires by type and then used push-in wire connectors to hook the neutral wires together as well as another connector for the ground wires. I needed a few more ground connections so I added another connector for the switches to ground to. I added my new smart dimmer switch, first wiring the black wire from the newly installed Romex cable to the load terminal of the switch and then added a piece of black cable taken from a scrap Romex cable to the line terminal of the switch, and this cable will hook up to the constant power coming to the existing three-way switch. Since this is a smart switch, it has a neutral wire, so I hooked that in with the others, and then plugged the ground into my ground wire connector. I added back the original switch and wired it just as it was before. 
Finally, I took the black cable from the new dimmer switch and plugged it into the push-in terminal on the back of the switch where the constant power comes into the original one. I pushed the wires and switches into the box and screwed the switches in place. With the electrical wiring done, we're ready to add the LED strip lights, but I thought it would be a lot easier to understand if I first demoed the process away from the cabinets. I started by trimming the LED strip to the length I needed by cutting it in the middle of one of the copper pad sections with scissors. I took the end of the LED cable, stripped the insulation off the ends of the wires with wire strippers, and twisted the wire strands together. I slid on a small section of heat shrink tubing over the wire, and then tinned the ends of the wires with solder, as well as the copper pads of the light strip. I connected the black cable to the negative pad of the strip, and the red cable to the positive pad. I slid the piece of heat shrink tubing over the connection and heated it up with a heat gun to shrink it and protect the connections. Since I'm using 12 volt LED lighting, I can test the lighting with a 12 volt tool battery to make sure that I have a good connection. Soldering the lights is going to provide the cleanest looking installation, but another option is to use these locking connectors that are made for these LED light strips. And these are installed by pulling away the adhesive backing slightly, sliding them onto the copper pads of the light strip, and locking it in place by closing the plastic door with your fingers, or as I found was needed to get it to actually lock, pushing it aggressively with a flat blade screwdriver. Using connectors like these instead of soldering the wires directly to the light strips is going to cost a bit more and not be as clean of an install, but it is an option if soldering isn't for you. And painter's tape works to hold the wires in place, but a soldering station like this one makes wiring up the connections a lot easier and is a good investment if you see yourself doing more work like this in the future. I wanted to install some LED light tracks to diffuse the light under the cabinet and give a finished appearance should anyone feel compelled to look under there for some reason. It was easiest to cut the aluminum track and the plastic diffuser at the same time, so I inserted the diffuser into the track and marked it about a quarter of an inch shorter than the space under the cabinet. I cut the track on its side with the plastic diffuser facing forward, which keeps the teeth of the saw blade on the miter saw from ripping the diffuser out of the aluminum track. The tracks come with mounting clips, but I found them to be lacking, so I removed the diffuser, center punched, and drilled a few holes centered on the back about three inches in from the ends. Then I deburred the holes by hand with a larger drill bit and put an end cap on one end. I put the track in place under the cabinet, center punched the hole locations, pre-drilled them, and used short washer head screws to mount the track in place. I found it was best to start at the end of a light run and work backwards, so I added this strip under the cabinet here first. And I did this just like the demo, stripping the sheathing and insulation from the LED cable I ran through the wall, sliding on the open end cap of the light track and heat shrink tubing, tinning the wires and copper pads, soldering the wires to the light strip, pulling the heat shrink tubing over the connection, and shrinking the tubing with the heat gun. I pushed the extra wire into the wall, removed the adhesive backing, and stuck the light strip in place in the track. And the strip was just slightly too long, so I trimmed the end. Before going any further, I tested my connection with a battery at the other end of the wire in the upper cabinet. And everything looked good, so I added a couple of quarter inch cable clamps to the underside of the cabinet to hold the cable in place. I inserted the diffuser into the track and removed the clear protective film, though I recommend removing this film just before putting the diffuser in as some of the film got stuck. I added another light strip at the top of the cabinet that connects at one end to the wire coming up through the wall and at the other to a wire that will go to the LED driver. Speaking of the driver, it comes pre-wired for use with a wall outlet, so I removed the cover, loosened the terminal screws, and removed the cord as well as the other cover on the 12 volt side of the driver. I placed the driver in the upper cabinet and cut off the excess Romex and LED cables, leaving each about an inch longer than needed. I took the LED cable, inserted the wires into the corresponding terminals, and screwed them down, then marked the mounting holes of the driver, pre-drilled those, and I screwed the driver in place. I stripped the sheathing from the Romex and clipped the ground wire as it's unused with this double insulated driver. I inserted the black cable into the line terminal and the white into the neutral terminal and tightened them down and pushed the extra cable into the wall cavity. And the lights for this cabinet are all hooked up, so let's test it out. So this cabinet is done, but I still need to add lights to the cabinet over there, as well as the one across the kitchen on the other wall. And adding these lights is gonna be a similar process to the first cabinet, so I'm only gonna cover the things that are new or different from the first one. 
I'm going to run the wires for the other cabinets through my ceiling, which I can do easily as I have open web truss ceilings. If you have traditional joists, it's likely going to be much easier to run the wires through the sides or on top of your cabinets where possible. I first drilled a half inch hole in the ceiling so I could run multiple LED cables through it. Now running wires typically requires lots of access holes cut in the drywall, so I took advantage of the holes already made in my ceiling where I installed recessed lighting to guide the fishing tape over from the other cabinet and to push the wire through the hole in the ceiling into that other upper cabinet. I needed an access hole under the cabinet on the other side of the stove and a double gang wall plate seemed a good size for one, so I used that to make an outline. I began cutting out the access hole, doubling the cuts at about a 45 degree angle so I could reuse the cutout piece as a patch and I almost forgot to mark across one of the edges before cutting it out all the way. And that mark serves as a reference for the orientation of the cutout piece which will be important when closing the hole later. Cutting the access hole allowed me to run the LED cable through the trim in the cabinet just like the other side. To repair the hole, I applied joint compound around the edges and then inserted the piece I cut out back into the opening using my reference mark to orient the patch. Beveling the edges when I cut this piece out allows it to be placed back and essentially glued in place by the joint compound. Once dry, I applied a skim coat of joint compound to level the surface, sanded it smooth, primed, and then painted over the patch. And I'm not worried about getting this patch perfect as it will soon be covered with the tile backsplash. I ran a wire over to the cabinets on the other side of the kitchen using my recessed lighting as access holes if I had traditional joists and not open web trusses, I think I would have added a separate smart switch and LED driver over here to avoid needing to drill through the joists to run a wire. I drilled a 3 8 inch hole through the tops of the upper cabinet so I could run a continuous LED strip across the top instead of cutting it into multiple segments. This wall of the kitchen is shared with the garage and is insulated which makes running wires more difficult. I had to cut multiple access holes to be able to get the wire from down below the cabinet up to the top, but I was able to cut all of these holes in areas where they will eventually be covered by backsplash or cabinetry, which was a plus. If all the wires run, I needed to hook them up to the LED driver, but the terminals on the driver really only have room for one wire, so I twisted the three negative wires together, added a short segment that will hook up to the driver, and twisted on a wire cap to secure the wires. I did the same for the positive wires and hooked them up to the driver. I added some clamps to organize the wires and put back the cover over the driver terminals. And let's give it a test. I used a smart dimmer switch over a standard dimmer switch as the lights will primarily be used in the evening and I wanted the lights to come on automatically around sunset and turn off around bedtime. And this works as expected and is really awesome. In addition to the path of your wiring and location of your LED light strips, there are a few design considerations that you'll need to account for when planning your cabinet lighting. I've included links to resources that will help you design your lighting down in the video description. You'll want to make sure that your lights are the appropriate color temperature for your space and I chose 3K LEDs as they match the color temperature of my overhead lighting. Before purchasing an LED driver, you'll need to figure out the wattage requirements of your lights my lights are wired in an array configuration with three separate lighting runs going into the LED driver. So I simply needed to add up the total length of my LED strips, which came out to about 13 feet. And using the power requirement chart for the LED light strips, I determined that at full brightness, my lights are pulling about 25 watts. And I likely would have been okay with a 30 watt driver, but I went with a 45 watt one just to be safe. The other major design consideration is voltage drop. The voltage will gradually decrease along the length of the wires, so the longer the wire or light strip run, the lower the voltage will be. And this is potentially an issue when you have a long wire run or a long strip of LED lighting, as the lighting may appear dimmer located far away from the driver when compared to the lighting that is closer. The total voltage drop is a function of the wire length, wire thickness, and the total watts used by the lighting system. And I put a link to a voltage drop calculator down in the video description. Before installing, I calculated that my plan wiring should result in an acceptable voltage drop, and I checked with the multimeter at the lights furthest from the driver after install and confirmed that this is the case. If you want to design and install your own cabinet lighting, all the resources, tools, and materials are linked down in the video description. So until next time, go build yourself and let there be light.